In this video, we're gonna talk about three ways that you might be losing money as a designer and might be losing clients. In addition, we're gonna talk about the commodification of design skills and the kind of bland center, as well as teaching typography and working in an agency. Live from quarantine land and the first chunk of this video is about three habits that might be costing you money, especially if you are an introvert or an empath or somebody else that has that thing where maybe you're afraid to ask for things or you're afraid to give the appearance that you're exploiting other people. This, I should change the name of the vlog to something like Driving with Joshua, but we'll never do that. Uh, the Daily Drive, Drive Time, whatever. Three behaviors that are actually characterized by non-action and that cost you clients. It may have cost you clients in the past. They definitely have cost me clients. The first way that this happens is by having one point of contact with the client. And if your contact leaves, you lose your client. That would be similar to if you had a job and your job was entirely contingent on your manager remaining gainfully employed. But let's say your manager is looking at porn on work time and gets fired. Should you get fired too? When you only have that one point of contact, that's what you're doing to yourself. I've done it more than once, actually with the same person. I had a friend who worked at a couple different brands over time who I got to do cool stuff for. And one of the things I never did because I'm uh, maybe too shy or too insecure or whatever, is I never said, hey, can you give me uh, an intro to either someone that worked in a different department, maybe someone that worked at a different brand but within the same building, or even your one just one of your immediate coworkers, just to have more connections. Because what ended up happening is, by virtue of working with this friend, I've had some great clients, but the client was always him. It was just a different entity that was signing the checks. And over time, I've lost three clients because he moved on and I didn't have any other connects. So if you have any clients right now and you only have one point of contact, start asking for introductions to other people. If you're doing good ongoing work, they'll be happy to refer you. You can't assume that they will automatically be referring you wherever they are because they might want to be keeping you as their little secret. They might not know if you need more work. So when you, if you're hoping that they'll organically start referring you around, you're being presumptuous. You don't know what's going on in that person's mind. So start asking for introductions so that you're not accidentally firing yourself. Number two, you're assuming that mistakes are a bigger deal than they are and you're not looking for repeat work from a client. I'm definitely guilty of this. I am an empath and I think one of the things that that manifests itself in is that I take failure way too personally. Even if something is not my fault, if it happens on my watch, I own it. A plus side of that is that it helps me learn from mistakes, but it also means that I do dumb stuff. I make a little mistake on a project, or maybe I don't even make the mistake, but I was involved in the mistake, and then I ghost myself from the client. Essentially, I don't let them decide that I suck and not to work with me anymore. I decide for them. It's a terrible habit. In general, you want other people to fire you. You do not want to fire yourself. So that's a really simple one. If you have some client that you made a mistake on the job and you're just assuming that they don't want to work with you anymore, don't assume that. They may have forgotten. As far as they're concerned, their workflow may be that everyone they work with makes that mistake. It could be contextual to the way that they're working. Even if you made a big blatant mistake, be that person with just insane intestinal fortitude who maybe you cost them 10 grand, still try to get more work. 
If they hate you, they hate you. And number three, you're not following up to get more work. Again, maybe you're trying to be a mind reader and you're assuming that when it's time for you to do more work that they'll just come right out and ask you, but you can't assume that. You have to assume that your existence is not this constant presence on other people's mind and that you have to remind them you exist because otherwise something else is going to come along that's cooler, shinier, maybe more front of mind. Maybe one of their colleagues has been working with a new designer and loves them and actually is trying to get that person work and that's going to steal work potentially away from you. The work isn't yours unless you ask for it. And that's kind of the overarching theme here. Whether it's continuing to ask for work after a mistake or a flub or a perceived mistake, whether it's asking for work from their network, whatever it is, you have to ask for the work. And the biggest way that people fire themselves is by not asking for the work not being in mind. I don't think it comes down to being obnoxiously around all the time. If you haven't dealt with a printer in a while and then you bump into them and you remember like, oh yeah, that person's cool and I haven't seen them in two years. And you remember that you like working with them. You know, like what caused that? It's that, that being present. Depending on your disposition, it might be really difficult to ask for work, but you have to get over it. It's critical to keeping your operation going, your career going. If you've been, say, only freelance or maybe contract or something like that, and you're struggling with the volume of work, a really good thing to do is go like contract at an agency or something that's having rapid growth. Because if they're having rapid growth, they're asking for tons of work. And while you're doing whatever you're supposed to be doing, spy on them and watch how the owners or new business people try to get as much of an eyeball on them as possible so that you can pick up some moves and bring it back to your practice. After recording this video, another kind of insight hit me about the way that some of us are wired and how that affects asking for things or going after work. I recently designed a CD package for my mother. What's up, mom? As we were working on it, we were on the phone quite a bit. And my mom said to me, she was like, you know, since we've been doing this project, I talk to you like 10 times more than normal. And I said something to the effect of, I like working with people more than hanging out with people. If I want to get together with people, the easiest way to do that is to work. Yeah, there's some videos from a while back where I was interviewing people who are visiting my class and then we go out to dinner afterwards. It's much easier for me to schedule a meal or a social thing with someone if I've scheduled a work thing with them first so that the social thing is just tacked on to the back end of it. Now, why I'm talking about this is because I have this tendency to think that the ideal state of getting a client is that I should develop a relationship and a friendship first. I think it's a lot like essentially the marketing strategy behind Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Work Week. A big part of it was that he developed, sort of mercenarily, but it's a win-win, he developed real friendships with all these tech bloggers at the time. And then they helped market the book. But it's this idea that he developed friendships and brought value to those people. I have it in my mind that the best thing I should do is become friends with everyone. And then if we happen to work together, we work together. One, that's obviously cool, right? No one complains about having more friends. But there is an aspect of that that runs essentially counter to my entire way of being, which is I really like 
working and I'm more inclined to become friends with you if we're working together. And that when we stop working together, that friendship is gonna fade. It's not because I'm done with you, it's because I put most of my effort into working. Where this additionally screws me up is throughout this video, we're talking about the importance of asking for things. And then one of the things that might hold you back, it holds me back from asking, is that, well, there's not a friendship or a relationship in place. But the way I am, it might be necessary to work together in order to create the friendship. I think this comes back to the really basic idea of self-awareness. You have to understand how you're wired and how you're gonna work. If you're a super social person, the way that you might get work is via your social circle. But if you're a, a person who work is the activity you most enjoy, you might need to remind yourself that you've gotta go and get the clients first and actually your circle of friends is gonna come out of the clients. Because being quite honest, I don't burn through friends, but I have to be so diligent to continue seeing people because I don't do social shit really. I work and I like working. So in addition to making sure that you're asking things, you wanna make sure that you're not holding an ideal in your head of how you should go about doing things. You don't have to schedule a friendly coffee with people in order to broach the topic of doing work again. If that's a very natural thing for you to do, then that's a totally different story. But for me, that's not supernatural. What makes a way more sense is to have a meeting and then go get the coffee. That's the thing I have to remind myself. Like I was just sitting here just thinking about this idea of like, somehow I've got it in my head that the way to do this is to establish that, that social channel first. But I really shouldn't do that because that's not naturally the way that I get work or get friends. And I need to remind myself of it because if I flip it and I focus on get the work and let the social relationships flow out of that, then I'm doing something I naturally would do and naturally want to do. And then I can double down on it or amplify it. I think it's really hard, at least for me, to double down on something that just doesn't feel like the way that I would do it. And I end up procrastinating. So part two here was recorded on a call a couple weeks ago. I was critiquing somebody's work, but as we were going through it, we talked a lot about design process, the nature of typography, uh, some of the demands that are put on you as a professional typographer. And, uh, and I think that there is a lot here that might be of value, especially maybe if you're building a portfolio or sort of coming to typography for the first time. Maybe for like, a little bit of context if you have to do something quickly and it's sort of like actual graphic design then it's going to lean on typography probably more than anything else but if if you don't have a kind of wide range of stuff that you've tried then you don't have much to work with when you have to work fast because i think most people are kind of stuck in a real comfortable middle that's sort of fine when you've got a bunch of other stuff to lean on but when you have to make something happen just with type, that's where you end up with a lot of really boring work. So doing a kind of deep dive into non-conceptual thinking ends up both benefiting you because you can do more with type kind of innately, but also you end up doing all this research for the future. The one thing that I think is really good about art school, and it doesn't require going to art school for it, is foundation year. This year where in each class, you're basically supposed to try as much stuff as possible with the expectation that it will be bad and that you will never look at it again. And I think that's like the single most valuable thing about art school because it's all about this kind of quantity over quality, but the, the quality comes through the 
effort and the range of experimentation. I think one of the things I was lucky about in going to MCAD is that that logic applies into the beginning of the graphic design program. It dies really fast after that, and it gets into the basic thing of come up with an idea, make it a masterpiece, blah, blah, blah. But in the beginning, it's literally like when you would get typography assignments, it would be like do 40 layouts of this thing, uh, which I think is like just the smartest possible thing because you'd have to try a lot of stuff. You experiment really wild, widely, but a lot of people have this like kind of fear of type that it should be really precious because it like it's meant to be read and there's all these rules and all of this stuff. But I kind of think that if you want to get good at it, you have to be real comfortable abusing it. And I kind of feel like it's better to learn how to do it then learn the rules as opposed to what most people do is learn the rules and then have such a narrow range of what's acceptable as a result of that when every graphic designer they like probably did the other thing free form and then picked up some rules when they made sense so that's that's kind of my logic typography it's the easiest thing in the world to do at a level that's acceptable it's just not that hard to get to a level that's like acceptably safe. But the problem is that that's not special. And every day new software comes out that makes that easier and easier. I feel like at this point you could make quality typography on your phone if you followed five rules, but do you make anything special? Not so much. You're kind of in that comfortable middle, which is a terrible place to be as like more and more technology makes it easier for everyone to be in the comfortable middle. Actually, I think this applies to anything I do, but the reason I'm so focused on process is that when you have the process dialed, you no longer require other human beings. When you have a really clear understanding of like a methodology, a lot of the times I think that you need deadlines and feedback and other people to make projects seem real, because otherwise they're these amorphous messes and that when you have a methodology dialed in, especially once it's like, match to your wiring, then it's like, you don't need those other people because for example, if you know that by week six of a project, you will have 10 to 12 working versions. You don't need feedback from other people. You just need to let them sit for two days and then pick the one that's the best. Boom, done. I like the idea that other people become icing on the cake. They're nice if they can give you good feedback, but they're not integral. I think art school makes other people completely integral. I don't think it does it on purpose, but I think it, it sets this thing up where you're actually super dependent on other people's feedback. And I actually think that that's really unhealthy. So one of the reasons I dial in on the process at such a kind of um, uh, like macro level or whatever, like very granular, I guess, is because I think once you do that, you can break it apart, remake it in your own vision but then when you jump into a project you know how to do it in a way that's fun and exciting and doesn't need a bunch of weird emotional leverage or like other people no longer need to weigh in because you'll know that you'll have a, a selection of stuff to choose from so a big recommendation i would make is when you duplicate your artboards or make new artboards move them further away from everything else and the reason that i would say that is that um if you're like zoomed in totally on something but there's stuff creeping in from the edges you cannot help but be making decisions based on what's happening around the edges like if i were to open up one of my illustrator files th there's like sometimes seas of space between things i just want to make sure that whatever i'm looking at i'm judging it on its own like for example if if i'm looking at this bottom row of stuff and there's three in a row that have like kind of the same type is it possible that I'm actually making them consistent because subconsciously I need them to look cleaner as a group? The thing I hate about design software is it loads in with all these like predetermined numbers. An Adobe product opens up with 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 24, 36, 72, whatever it is, right? And you can put in other numbers, but that means you have to sit there and think about it as opposed to can you just grab the word and scale it up until, until you look at it and you go, too small, too big, or just right? 
without having to kind of conceptually be like, okay, let's try 102. Because then the other thing is like, you start getting a 400 and you're like, oh, is this too big? As far as grids, don't worry about a grid. One, because it's one poster. It doesn't need a grid because it doesn't relate to any other piece of information. It's not like it's a book where page 102 needs to relate to page 72, which needs to relate to the table of contents. That's where, like, that's where a grid matters. But even if I was making a poster series, first I would design the posters, like a couple of them. Then I'd figure out what was the structure underneath it. And then I would be like, oh, that must be the grid. Kind of like if I was analyzing the structure of a photograph, I would look at the photograph. I wouldn't invent a structure and then be disappointed that the photograph didn't live up to it. Do you look at like Swiss typography at all? Like old school, like 60s Swiss typography? The whole reason that that stuff never ceases to be relevant and actually becomes more relevant in like a Pinterest age is because it's entirely built on the negative space between things being activated and popping. So when you see this little thumbnail of this, what is basically this ungodly, boring piece of graphic design, but it's not because it's stuff's happening. But like, if you don't know how to describe it, you're just like, oh, this is cool and minimal. But the reason you think it's cool and minimal is because of all the craziest shit that's happening with the white space. It's one of the cheats for making type only stuff really cool. I'm weird about things that seem tasteful to me. And I think it's because like in the real world, everybody all day pushes you towards sort of tasteful, but the stuff that's interesting is always extreme. Whether it's extremely small or extremely big, like, like the Swiss typography stuff, the magic of that is like the extreme of it. And nobody ever lets you be extreme. So I always kind of push towards that. So what will happen is you work on type only layouts for a while then you shelf them and you're going to forget about them and then you're going to work on image making around the same topic and how you approach it there's a variety of ways a combination of maybe you'll make conceptual images maybe you'll just make cool textures but you'll just investigate imagery in the same format the last step to that is to then go okay out of all these images i've made and all this typography i've made what stuff works together and talks to each other. What is nice about this, and I think we talked about this idea that the project should get easier as it moves ahead. This piece, the red techno on the side, might more or less be done. You make some tweaks to it and it might be the thing. That means that as you work on this to do these other investigations and to do this kind of recombinant thing where you bring type and image together, it doesn't matter what happens during that time because you may have already solved the problem. But what ends up happening is like the project gets easier because you've got some stuff that already works. Then you're making images and you're like, oh shit, I just need two lines of type on this image. It will work beautifully. As you work, you get more and more excited. If instead what we did was the sort of normal thing, you tighten up this techno thing. Then I tell you, all right, cool. Give me a final in three weeks. You obsessively fuck with this for weeks. So what we're trying to do is actually like get these big things that solve our problems now. And then if we're gonna tweak them, you don't tweak things until the client tells you they want the thing that you're about to tweak. So then you, it puts you in this sort of fantastic position because later you might investigate these natural structures and how it might hold imagery or texture or whatever. At the same time, you might do that and be like, you know what, this thing works as type only. This is the piece it needs nothing. So that's kind of the logic and that's how you get it. That idea that the very end of this project should be so easy compared to today because the very end might be just fine tuning the, the space right there and it will take 20 minutes. Essentially with any of this stuff, I imagine it like whatever makes it interesting means it's kind of sitting out on some kind of limb. I just think it, you always walk to the end and jump. If there's like a little bit of white space, cool stuff happening, then a lot of white space, cool stuff happening. If it's sort of organic, then go crazy organic. That's the logic, right? Like whatever's special about it, 
amplify. And it, it, even if you have to go to the point of unreadability, because you can always bring it back in. It's always easier to reel yourself back in from too far than to push yourself to too far. I don't know why that is, but so I always feel like it's better to go like, oh shit, I made it that you can't see anything. All right, let's bring it in a little bit, as opposed to constantly being like, well, I didn't know if I should make it any bigger. I kind of always feel like you should never have that feeling. You should always be like, bigger. Oh, too big, and pull it back. You find the thing that's special about it, you push it to the, to the edge, but sometimes the thing that was special only worked when it was idiosyncratic, when it seemed random. That's the other thing I would say is like, don't get caught up in intention. When it works, to amplify it, it works. Kind of like always push it a little bit, but then if the original is better, be like, oh cool, glad I tried that. It confirms that the other thing I did before I thought about it was the way to go. I so what this is where I, one of the reasons why I think it's always fine to go off on a limb is that you're going to have standards that guide you regardless. I think you can push almost towards ugliness because you give a shit and because you have standards. And the other thing is you can completely ignore every single thing I say and I won't be offended in the least. Um, cuz in a lot of ways I'm just exposing my particular bias towards constructing an image, right? Like that I'm like, no, 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 big lines running through, blah, blah, blah. Anchor everything off that, make that the concept. But at the same time, like that's what would maybe excite me visually. The other thing is weird is like, I really don't, this is how I critique in class. I just talk about shit that I like and stuff that might make me like it more. Because my goal is like really like I don't want to critique anything. I just want people to make so much stuff that I can pick out the things I think are great and then call it a day, if, which is like maybe it's antithetical to how I was taught, but I kind of wish I had been taught that way. A lot, a lot of times when you're like being loose is once you start going like, I think I have an edit of stuff do like a quick run through. Oh, that's bleeding off a little bit. Shrink it down slightly, but don't get caught up into how much of the E is chopped off. But that's more about the idea that like once the thing's in front of someone, they start appraising it based on what's there, regardless of your intent. You don't get tweaky, but look for anything where you're like, oh, that looks like it could be a mistake. Pull it in slightly, but don't be like kerning the B and the A or something ridiculous like that. Me personally, I'm not a big revision type person on my own work. I tend to be like, nah, it's done. And then if it's still intriguing to me later and I look at it and I go, oh, maybe I'll do this. But I tend to do so much work that I just make it that I don't have time to do revisions. I kind of take it as is. And unless I see what I think is a mistake, I fix the mistake. But if I look at it and I think like, oh, I could work with this. I just go, oh, it must be done. It's unclear whether that's healthy necessarily. It's what works for me. This last chunk was recorded at MCAD last semester. And in this chunk, we get into design process and how sometimes it seems like having a cool, interesting process is only something that you get to do in school. But the reality is that having an interesting career seems to be predicated on having an interesting process. We would do this project where it bring in box of stuff and it would be like an object and then a traditional not necessarily a mark making tool, but a thing you use to make stuff with like stencils or like circle templates or triangles. And then you'd get like an, a random thing as well. And then you just make stuff for probably three weeks. And then once you'd made a bunch of stuff, then you'd make a project using that stuff. This woman, Kristen had, I gave her half a bag of marshmallows and, and she made these amazing images of the marshmallows cooking in the oven and it looked like this like lake of hell. You gave me a stencil and I got blue sand and put it on ice. So is that ice with sand with the stencil inside it? I used the stencil to make the circles, those blue circles, and the blue circles are blue sand on ice that I think I put food coloring in. So that's where the yellow comes from. This project is inspired by a designer named 
Martin Vinesky in his studio. They do, but a lot of times they would start projects off with these kind of random material studies and they would just make stuff for a while and then they'd kind of figure out the stuff they made made sense for the actual client project. His company is called Appetite Engineers and I highly recommend looking up their stuff. It's like a, lo a lot of it's like hyper handmade. But he also just did a lot of stuff of like playing with like drawing tools that he'd buy at like the dollar aisle at a Walgreens or something like that to like generate all of this um, form. And I think what's interesting is like just in terms of the process stuff overall is that there's all these ways of like getting somewhere and getting somewhere interesting and different beyond the normal design process. You guys are kind of going through the normal design process but doing it in a methodical way. The results kind of are extremely clear as to like why that's actually a good thing. But then there's these other ways of getting there, like cooking marshmallows and photographing it and then being like, oh, okay, I made something interesting and then kind of feeding it into stuff. Like I had a thing I finally ended up using that was like this chunk of a painting that was distorted, but I just like kept, I put it in one project and then like that didn't get used. So I was like, okay, cool. I put it in Adidas project and then like that never happened. I was like, okay, cool. And then I put it back in like a thing for myself. It's nice when you have like your own like image library that makes you not dependent on the rest of the world. I think trying to figure out there's the work that you do that's like your work. One of the things is like, that's super good. It makes you better at your craft. It makes you faster. But there's a certain point at which like, when you're doing a job, you just get better at doing the job. You don't necessarily become a better designer. You know, like I have a friend that worked on like Target Optical for years. Every single thing is the same. You get better at cropping, you get better at casting models, you get better at art directing photo shoots, but you don't get better at actual graphic design because your creative energies are so focused into one particular thing. And then what I th think happens to a lot of people is that you spend your eight hours a day roughly getting better at this one hyper-specific form of design. You kind of don't want to do more work on top of that. And then you're consuming and looking at lots of stuff in theory to be more creative, but there's no place for that more creative energy to go because it's not going to go into target optical. It creates this weird gap between like what you appreciate and what you're capable of, not what you're capable of, what you appreciate and what your current context defines. And then the actual play part disappears. But the play part, I think, is where you actually grow as a designer. If you're working and then you roughly have, say, eight hours a week to do other creative work, but that includes looking at tons of cool stuff, I would almost be like, you want to cut that eight down to three hours of looking at stuff and five hours of making stuff for no reason. It's in those five that you can make the discoveries about what you're doing because you're no longer beholden to banks and health insurance companies and printers. You do that work to make the jumps in what you're capable of. And then when you're looking at stuff, instead of looking at it for creative inspiration or whatever, you're looking at it, making connections between the new discoveries that you're making. And instead of like looking at stuff, I feel like you're reflecting on stuff. If you just decide to try to figure something out, like, like if you start trying to make like music, the minute you start doing that, when you start listening to music, you start hearing it in a totally different way because you start to notice things that were never a concern to you before, but it required making the thing to really appreciate what it is that's that's happening around you. In terms of what you're doing, just kind of like try your best to always carve out a lane of something that resembles play. Whether it's like the projects that you're doing right now or whether it's completely open-ended, like what happens if I cut open 100 glow sticks and photograph them in the dark so that you can make those discoveries that are gonna like stretch you. Because the big thing is like in the traditional design world of like agencies and in-house places, there's this weird goal to age out of being a graphic designer. Like, would you agree with that? 
Yeah. Yeah. True. There's this bizarre thing. It's it's very like agency and hierarchy specific, which is like junior designer, senior designer, junior art director, senior art director, junior creative director, senior creative director. And by the time you get to that point, you just go to meetings. Yeah. It's your entire life. And then that's when you're like, you know, I've started painting in the garage. Now, I say that, <laughs> that completely con contradicts what I just said, <laughs> but that's because you like completely have ruined <laughs> your life, basically, because now it's like you literally have like a nine to five in every sense of the word. But Martin Finesky that I just brought up, I mean, I first was like aware of his work in 1996 or seven. So that's 20 something years ago. That guy still makes actual graphic design that has grown and changed since then because like you can only grow and change by doing new and interesting work. If he went into an ad agency like circa 2005, it would just be like, oh, I wonder what happened to Martin Finesky. He used to be really good. Because that's what happens to everybody that goes into an ad agency that was a good designer. Whereas like Vim Crowell, you know, he just died two months ago or something. He probably died with his computer open finishing the spread of a book. One of the most influential graphic designers of the 20th century designed to the last minute. Now he didn't design like full time. He did like a project a year when he like came down off his cloud to come do it. But still it wasn't like he was like, oh, you know what? I'm 82, I should be the extra senior vice creative director at this point in my career. I was like, no, I'm a graphic designer. I do graphic design and I like continue to grow. And obviously there's creative directors that are good and, and that actually they, like what they what do. But the reason that creative directors ruin a great deal of work is that uh, I think a whole lot of them are resentful of the situation that they've created because they never meant to be sitting in meetings all day. So then when your work is in front of them and they just start tearing it apart, it's because it's the closest they can get towards making something. Because like they never was like 19, freshman in school and be like, I cannot wait. By the time I'm 37, meetings from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. is going to be amazing. I'm going to feel super unhealthy because I never get to have lunch because everyone schedules meetings during my lunch. All of you can figure out how to finish this project on your time going forward because it's like crystal clear. Probably the hardest part will be picking directions, picking final pieces, which is a way better, pro like that's the best problem in the world to have is not being able to pick which of the awesome things that you're not super attached to that you could go with. I had to make a record cover for myself a few weeks ago. I made like 12 options. I sent the PDF to a bunch of people and just said like by a text, like what do you like? And they voted. And I was like, all right, option two it is. Because it's like, I can't pick, but I like them all. When you have a client and you love one and you hate one, but you have to show them two, they always pick that one you hate. Or they pick the one that you love, but they grab everything from the one you hate and, and bring it together. And then that's like extra painful. But if you can have like five that you're just sort of like, that's cool and that's cool and that's cool. And you can like learn to love it. That's such a nice position to be in. Like, I don't know if anyone else feels that way, but I really like the idea that that like no one has a super clear idea of like what's the absolute best thing that I've done and it's like I don't know this is cool and that's cool I find it super liberating and I think when you start having that approach with client work when you go into meetings and you sort of don't care what happens anymore because whether it's, oh, it's super easy to make more options, it's not difficult to come up with ideas, but then the other thing is like, they can't hurt your feelings anymore. When someone has 10 awesome things, when you're on the other side of that table looking at the 10 awesome things, and you have a gut reaction to one, you can be like, oh, I hate that. The other person's not, it's probably slightly annoying, but it's not nearly so bad. Like I can give way harsher critiques when someone has five awesome things and then I can be like, I really don't like this. And it doesn't matter because it's like there's four rad things next to it. And it creates like a, a really nice situation that sucks a lot of the stupid stuff out of graphic design. You know, if you go to like an AIGA function, you will hear like a lot of complaining about clients. And to be sure, there is a lot of sucky things in the world that are, are a pain in the ass. But when you can figure out how to do lots of work really quickly, 
that you're not super ego invested in. Like you're ego invested in the project, but not in, oh, specifically, I have a huge attachment towards this arrangement of colors, type, and nuts. If you say anything about it or you make any changes to it, I'm gonna wanna kill you because I spent 72 hours creating this thing like that's why everyone's upset and hates their clients because like the client insulted something that the other person is head over heels in love with or struggled so hard to get to that point it creates a lot of like toxicity in the process that is largely the result of when you're too attached to any particular thing you tend to get a little bit weird about it like you've made a masterpiece and then they want to change it to purple and it's like, if it was supposed to be purple, I would have made it purple. It's clearly supposed to be fluorescent green because it is fluorescent green. In like, let's see, so it's 17 years of professional working. I can remember three things that people said to me that were helpful and they were not things that made projects better. They were just truisms. My crazy boss used to say, if, if you were explaining something and it took more than 22 seconds, he'd be like, too tricky. And that was it, you were done. Like even if it was just like you were bad at explaining but the thing was good, that was super valuable. But he never actually said anything individually about the work that made any of it better. <laughs> and then um, I never knew when you design identity systems like stationary that the logos should be the same size through every piece. So that was something that someone told me. <laughs> Todd Paulson at Knock. And then one other person who I hate <laughs> Anyway, told me that when you're doing motion graphic, just make sure two things are always happening at once, which turned out to be like the best piece of advice. But then again, like that's like saying, you know, if you're bleeding stuff off the edge, always hit three edges. You know, it's like, it's helpful, but like, <laughs> I'm sure there's places where you go, where you grow as a designer. I just don't know where they are. <laughs> no. I will say I think that ex experiences that you get at the places tend to be the thing that help you grow less so than the people like going to it didn't make me better as a designer except that the expectation was that I would work fast and then it turned out I liked working fast and I just didn't realize it I didn't get to come up with the ideas but I got to sit adjacent to stuff that expanded my scope of what was possible and how easy it was to do a really grand project. Like we're gonna take over all the video screens in Times Square on New Year's Eve at intervals and then having to come up with the graphics for that. If someone had told me to do that on my own, I probably would have been like, yeah, I'm not doing that. I don't have no idea where to start. And then once you got used to how they worked, it was like, oh, you find a photo of Times Square and you Photoshop patterns into it. And then you find programmers and then they just do it and you're like, oh, so that's how multi-million dollar projects happen. It's literally like you find a picture, you Photoshop it up and say like, it'll be like this. And, and, and like that was like huge because I was at Intermedia Arts and all my briefs, the budget always said zero, which meant I was making laser prints. And what I would do is like I could use colored paper or I would do really maniac stuff on my own. Like, well, I'll just cut them all myself and then I can have a full bleed or like cut an angle into a sheet of paper, just something to make it seem like it wasn't a laser print. Or, or sometimes I'd bring a box of stuff to Kinko's and have them fold it and pay out of my own pocket just to try to make the stuff better. But so to go from that to Target, what I thought I was gonna go from was no feedback because I was the only designer to this environment full of designers where I'd get way better. But instead what it was is that I just got a much fuller view of what was possible, which was really helpful when I started doing like experiential stuff at Latitude. I understood how you tell those stories to people, uh, which like if I was at Intermedia Arts and then had been told, oh, you need to design an exhibit. I mean, I might have literally thought that the first step would be like, okay, measure the wall, design the, the first thing that goes on this wall. Now go inside, design this thing, design this thing, design this thing, because that's like kind of how it worked. And then, it, you know, you realize like, it starts with a photo of something and you kind of like, you color it a little bit or you decide what you're going to do here. But it's like, it's these big, broad strokes. But like when I worked in a really practical world, it wasn't broad strokes. I just like, I made this hyper specific thing that needed to be made. And I didn't know that idea of like, like when you're going to brand every surface in the New York uh, Times Square subway station or whatever it is, you realize like, oh, you can't do this in a pragmatic way. It was all that kinds of, kind of stuff that did help me grow. Uh, I think I came out the other end and was like, 
I'm either better than I think I am or everything sucks worse than I thought it did. That was kind of like how I came out of like Target. I thought I was gonna be so good by the time I left Target. Like it was gonna be like school or something. Number one, never ask me about font pairings. How to know if two fonts go together is you try and put them together and you like them or you don't like them. There's all of this like whole body of knowledge about stuff that doesn't matter that undermines your ability to make your own decisions. And I want you to ignore that. This is strangely a question that comes up so often because a lot of books make you think it matters, but it really doesn't. It's up there with, can I use more than two fonts on a page? Yes, you can use more than two fonts on a page and they can even look.